Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Great to see you. If you have a Bible with you, can we turn to Luke chapter 11, verses 5 to 13? And in fact, we actually pick up um, the text just after Jesus in the Sermon on the Plain. Um, now, not the plain. They didn't exist then. The plain as in not the mountain, but the big, vast area. Um, so whenever Jesus is teaching them how to pray, and he's just done the Lord's Prayer and um, explained that to them, and then we're going to pick that up from there. So Luke 11. And what we have here is we, we have a story or a parable, a poem, and then an illustration. So Jesus is really showing us how to communicate something and delve in. Um, my dad, actually, whenever I had my first sermon, and many of you know my dad's a preacher as well, and he said, you need to get a hammer, in, or you need to get a nail in the wall and hammer it from different directions. Um, and if you keep hammering it from different directions, hopefully the nail sticks in the wall and we hold on to what's being said. And that's what Jesus does here. He is hitting the same nail continually as he teaches something through story, through poem, through uh, illustration. So let's have a, a look at that. So verse 5 um, through to 13, and it says, Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one outside, er, sorry, the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, Though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who receives, who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Um, I don't know whether you've ever been on a roller coaster, but I quite enjoy roller coasters. Now, as I get older, I can't be bothered with the hassle of queuing up for them. But I love the thrill and the frightening bit. I don't, the, for me, the scariest bit's the bit up on the way up, and then you just get to go, and it's absolutely brilliant. And so I've had the privilege of being on some of the largest roller coasters in the world. Whenever I was in America, I, in a place called Cedar Point in Ohio, I got to go on the largest wooden roller coaster in the world, and it shook the bones clean out of me. It was unreal. But I've also been on, uh, and it's probably been superseded since this, but the Pepsi Max in Blackpool. Anybody done the Pepsi Max in Blackpool? And it's, oh boy, you think you're going into the water at one stage. You're like, Wee-oh! and away you go. And, and uh, so then even Port Aventura, anybody been to Port Aventura and Salou, and there's the dragon can, and you're Wee-oh! all the way like that. We were joking, uh, my brother-in-law, John, and his son, Johnny, and they're all like big men now, but uh, we went on holiday and we traveled into Salou and we went to this place, Port Aventura, and I loved the roller coasters, but at that stage, like Alison could, couldn't be bothered with them and the, the girls were too small to go on them. So I was relying on my brother-in-law and my nephews to queue up with me and go along. So we queued up, it must have been for an hour and a half, two hours to go on this one roller coaster. And whenever John and Johnny got to the to see actually what happened, it just shot you out. Didn't, didn't show you what all was happening. Just shot you out at a rate of knots. And as soon as they seen what happened, they literally did this. So the, the seats were like there, and you stepped in, and they went and stepped on over to the other side. And I said, what are you doing? And they were like, well, we're just, uh, no, I'm not doing that. Now, Johnny says today, I wish you had told me to suck it up and just do it. I was like, uh, well, your dad wouldn't let you. And his dad admitted, he said, I was glad you didn't go on it, son. Give me an excuse. So I was left to go on it my own, and I loved every minute of it. But it's really hard to describe what a roller coaster is like. I'm getting somewhere with this. But it's really hard to describe what a roller coaster is like. And so if you've never been on one, you might say, have you ever been in the car and you're maybe not looking and it's a country road and you hit a dip and you get that wee feeling in your tummy? Anybody ever had that? Right, well, it's a bit like that, but so much more. Right, it's like that, but so much more. Right, so this idea of lesser to greater is a way of helping us understand something that maybe we're not fully grasping or we haven't quite experienced. Jesus, whenever he's talking here, 
He's trying to connect them to the Father heart of God. He's trying to get them to understand that God, He is all of those things that they have learned growing up, but He is so much more. And He is so wonderful and so amazing. And so He uses examples. And in the parables, you have this principle called from the lesser to the greater. So it's like, it's like that, but so much more. So sometimes we're looking at the parables and we're like, why would he tell a story like that? Well, he's trying to get them to, well, it's like that, but it's so much more. So it's a roller coaster like, now some of you might say, well, you want to see my husband driving? It is like a roller coaster, but it's not the same, but it's, it's like that feeling, but it's, it's more, so much more. And so that's what this is all about. There's stories, poems, illustration, as Jesus tries to get a point across. Now, here's what I believe the point is. And often they'll say, again, in preaching class, you should be able to summarize your sermon in one sentence. And if you can't, it's all over the shop, okay? So here's my one sentence. And I think this is Jesus' one sentence as well in his sermon here. It's, it's this, God gives good gifts to everyone who asks. God gives good gifts to everyone who asks. And our question today is that question, how much more? But let me break that down really simple for us today. God gives good gifts. God gives good gifts to everyone who asks. And I'm just going to break that sentence down. So God gives. Jesus is trying to communicate a God who is not distant, but a God who is a Father who gives. As I say, and we've sung and led into it, and we've said the Lord's Prayer this morning, and we've come off the back of that, and Jesus is trying to help them understand that whilst, and they would have had a huge respect for the sovereignty, the holiness, the might of God, El Shaddai, the mountain mover, the God who is amazing, the warrior God, the, the mighty God, the creator God, they had all of these images of who this incredible God was, but Sometimes, and maybe we can fall into that a little bit sometimes, too, is that we have this massive view of God, but we miss the fact that he's also Father and he's here and he's in our midst. We have this huge big view of God, but we miss. Now, we don't want to get it the other way around either and just think, oh, he's my wee chum. No, no, he's massive. He's mighty. He's warrior God, creator. He's both. He's God who is mighty, but he's also God who is near. And so when Jesus is teaching them to pray, to Abba. That, that language that a child may have uttered to his father, Abba, the first words, Abba, near, intimate, close. It's, he's trying to help them understand this about this is who God is. And they're in an incredibly religious society where there's been so many blocks between them and God, but Jesus is saying, he's your Abba. This is who he is. And so he's not far and removed. He's close. He's intimate. And so he starts to give them some illustrations that this Abba, this God is a God who gives. And so he comes to this story. I don't know, but you have always found this story a little bit strange. Um, and those of you remember, uh, he's not here today, uh, but Alex and Tracy. Alex used to be a part of a thing called Logan and Rob. And uh, they did these skits. And one of the skits was based on this particular story. So I, I, I remember that. And um, I'll remind him of it next time I see him. But um, it's, it's this story can be a little bit, what's really happening here? Well, basically, a visitor comes to the village, and it seems like he has arrived at night, which for some times wouldn't have been a, a, an uncommon thing, because at times they traveled at night due to the heat, and it was the best time to travel. So this visitor arrives at night. Now, in our culture, that's an inconvenience, right? In our culture, if I said to you, goodness sake, like my, my, my great uncle Charlie, who I don't actually have, by the way, right? But my great uncle Charlie arrived from America to, today. He didn't tell me he was coming and he knocked the door at three o'clock in the morning and expected me to give him something to eat. Now, you would be sympathizing with me if I was annoyed about that, wouldn't you? You'd be saying, how inconvenient, that's terrible, right? Our culture is completely different to the culture here. There was an expectation that no matter when I would turn up at your door, that you would find a place for me, that you would feed me, that you would help me. Anybody want to return to that culture? I could just turn up at your door and, hello, where's the roast beef, please? Right? So, so here's this. He, this person comes unannounced, but the culture is that you provide. The culture is that you have to give them a meal. And even if they're not hungry, right, we would do the polite thing, wouldn't we? Oh, no, 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 no. I had something on the plane. No, even if you're not hungry, you're to get something to eat. It's the culture. It's the way it is. But this visitor comes to a home where there is no food. 
They have ran out of their food. They didn't cook daily. They may have cooked all of their bread for a week. And for whatever has happened here, there's no bread. But they happen to know in the village, there's going to be somebody who has some bread left over. And this bread was like a flat bread, a, a, um, something that they would have used to. This wasn't even, he wasn't going asking for the full meal. It, he was coming looking for, uh, it's like naan bread with your takeaway. That's, it was the idea they would have ripped it off and that would have been how they, they lifted up the other meats and juices that had been cooked for them. So he's not asking for the full meal. He's just, I've run out of bread. Can you help me? So he comes to the door, knocks the door, shouts, wakes up uh, this neighbor and asks, I've run out of bread. Somebody's come. Would you help me? Now here's the twist in the story. We're all with the guy who's got woke up. Here, you're going to wake the kids and the door's locked. Come on, I'll see you in the morning. We're with him, but not, not the culture of the day. The, the, the people here in the story initially, in fact, we don't pick it up in the language, but Jesus prefaces this with, um, it's almost like, right, wait here, guys. Can you imagine somebody doing this? Now, in the story, they're all expecting to say no. They're going, no, no, none of us would ever refuse to help. None of us. No, wait, no. And so it's, it's, there's this emphatic idea that the answer from the crowd is no. But Jesus shifts the story. And this is where they go, whoa, because the neighbor refuses to help initially. And he finds excuses. He's like, oh, well, I'd rather pull my, my, my blanket over me and go back to sleep. Don't wake up the kids. I, I don't want to have to get up and open the door. And he, for some reason, is pushing this guy back. Now, it goes on to say later, if not for a friend, he does it out of his persistence. So the text has given us an idea that there's been some fallout here. There's some disconnection. That quite possibly the neighbor coming asking for help is a bit of an outcast. He's a bit estranged. He's not part of the regular community. There's, there's a disconnect that's going on. Now this will trace through some of the other things that Jesus said. And that's Initially, what the hearers of the story might have thought, as you and I would, if it was a story based around our culture, they're going to go, why would he refuse to help? Is there a relational problem? Is there something between these two? Is there a disconnect? So that's what's going on. And as I say, the text goes on and Jesus says, out of this man's persistence, then the reluctant neighbor helps. He helps, and not only does he help, if you notice in the text, it says he gives as much as he needs. So there's an abundance because of persistence, okay? So this guy who maybe finds himself on the outside, because he persists and pushes through, there's then an abundance that comes. And Jesus is saying, okay, so there's some of you that might find yourselves on the outside. There's some of you who may expect God to pull the blanket over, roll over and say, not today, thank you. But when we persist, God gives. God pours out. I don't know about you, I think that's good news. God gives. And this is part of the story. Now, we'll unpack this more as we go. But remember that, catch that in our minds, that even a member that's of the community that seems to be on the outside, with persistence, then God gives as much as they need. But then he moves into the poem. Okay, so that's the story, and then the poem. And the poem is, ask, and you will receive. Knock, and the door will be opened. Seek, and you will find. Why? Because God gives, and it's this encouragement to give. We'll unpack that a little bit in a moment. And then he breaks into the illustration, and he says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Again, all the way through here, he employs this lesser to greater. So how much more? You people, you guys, us as fathers, with our fallen nature, with our tendency to be sinful, with our ability to be selfish, with our um, constant bias away from doing what's right, if you're able to give good gifts, how much more than the Father who is in heaven? How much more of a giver is he? 
Jesus is trying to communicate to us that God gives. But not just that he gives, that he gives good gifts, right? And this is good news. He gives good gifts. Again, we unpack the story that um, reminds us that this man got as much as he needed. Even a neighbor who didn't really want to get out of bed knew how to meet, meet the needs of an estranged person in his village. How much more the Heavenly Father, and this is really simple this morning, but it's a reminder, how much more does the Heavenly Father know how to give us good gifts? James 1, 17 says that every good gift comes from the Father of heavenly lights with whom there's no shifting or change. Do you know every good thing in our lives comes from him? No such thing as a self-made man. No such thing as a self-made woman. There's no such thing as, oh, I've got this. I've No, no, God, he gave you the propensity, the gifts, the ability, the talents. Every single good gift that comes into our lives is from God. It's from him. He's a giver of good gifts. In fact, we hear this, Second Peter 1, 3 says, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. He's given us some things. No, no. What's he given us? Nobody was listening, right? What has he given us? Everything. He's given us everything. Remind yourself of that tomorrow morning or not so much tomorrow morning, whenever the buzz of Sunday's gone away. On Thursday morning, he's given me everything that I need to lead a godly life. What does it say? His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. He's a good God who gives good gifts. He knows what to give. And here's the pattern then in this story. So, and some of our texts don't have, there's three in in a lot of the the original manuscripts. So some of your Bibles might have the three comparisons. Mine only has the two, but here are the three. So the three are, which of you fathers for bread will give a stone? Okay, and the point here is that even in dimming light, uh, a, a, a rolled up piece of bread could be mistaken or a, a could be, a, as a bit of stone could be mistaken for that piece of bread, that, that rolled up loaf. And, and he's saying, you fathers, you know the difference between that which is going to smash somebody's teeth in and something that's going to nourish them. You know what to give and how to give good gifts. Or if your son asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake instead. And in fact, in the original translation, the idea of snake, so because you think fish, sea, snake, what's that all about? Well, it probably means like a, 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 a sea snake. So it's talking about, uh, there's, there's eel-type creatures found in Galilee, in the Sea of Galilee. And the fishermen, whenever, I'm about to cast a rod, but they wouldn't have been casting a rod, that I had their nets. But whenever they would have caught up these eel-type creatures, which could grow to five meters in length, or sorry, five Five feet, five meters, five feet in length, huge big things, but they weren't nice. They were unclean for a Jew to eat. And so what the fishermen would have done was throw them back. And Jesus is saying, you know, you know not to give them that stuff. It's not good for them. It's not nice. It's not good. And it's unclean. You know to give them fish instead of an eel or a sea snake or an egg instead of a scorpion, and again, a rolled up scorpion, that thing that has the ability to harm or even kill, whenever it's all contracted, could in dim light be mistaken for a scorpion, an egg, sorry. If you, fathers, know how to separate between good things and things that are harmful, things that are beneficial and things that will pull down, how much more our God. How much more do we get to trust God to know, to give us good things into our lives, to release the things that we need? Uh, And I I, I don't know about you, I have probably wanted a stone at times and not the bread. I have probably in my life looked and thought that thing was attractive, but it turned out to be a scorpion and not an egg. I've possibly even prayed for the eel but God has been so gracious to give me fish instead. I don't know whether any of you are like that. I don't know whether there's something that your desire has pulled you towards, but God has said no to that because he knows how to give us good 
gifts. We've seen it so many times in our lives. I don't have time to go in. Let me give you one illustration. First time we ever bought a house. And honestly, I was a nightmare whenever we were buying our first house. Wasn't all of a sudden, I saw potential in everything. Like we went into this house that had no bathroom or toilet. And I'm not a plumber or an electrician or anything like that. But I was like, it's got potential. I wonder what they're taking off her. You know, I mean, I was just crazy. And like, you know, thankfully, People spoke sense into us, but there was this one occasion where Alison and I, and for various reasons, we got really drawn to this house. And it was a very small house, which is totally fine, but it was a small house, um, uh, just lots of things, but we were really drawn to it, and we, our hearts got attached to it. Anybody else, you're like that with a house or a car or something like that, and it's like, oh, I really want that, I really, God, it has to be that. And we prayed and we prayed, and um, it was in that time whenever things were just going crazy, and we got outbidded within a, a day or two, and we were like, oh, we were completely gutted that we had missed out on this house because we thought it was meant to be. But it turns out it was a stone and not bread. Because the next, in fact, it was that day, out of our disappointment, we went, oh, we'll just, we'll go and we'll look at the estate agents. And we found a house that was larger. It was positioned in a better place because uh, two months after us moving into our new house, we ended up moving churches. And it was right on the motorway for us to be able to get up the road and to where we needed to be. God saw way ahead of where we were. And we did do it up and God blessed us through it. You see, God doesn't give us stones. He gives us bread. He doesn't give us eels. He gives us fish to nourish us. He doesn't give us scorpions, things to harm us. He gives us eggs to feed us. This is, God knows how to give us good gifts. But here's the interesting thing. So Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is an itinerant preacher and he's probably preached all over the place doing different things um, and, and saying similar stories. So if I was a preacher, an itinerant preacher, I'd probably say a lot of the same things in different places. And it seems that's what Jesus did. And he taught in different ways and he said things and emphasized things based on who was around him. And so in this Sermon on the Plain, um, Luke decides to record some of what Jesus says, but Matthew says, uh, in regards of the good gifts, Matthew doesn't narrow that down. He leaves it general. Luke narrows it down to the Holy Spirit. And here we go for the day of Pentecost. So Luke narrows it down to the Holy Spirit. In the idea, in the context of good gifts, how much more then will the Father give you the Holy Spirit? And what Luke wants to do, because remember, Luke is... He's living life with Paul. Luke's on the missionary journeys with Paul. He's seen what the Holy Spirit's doing all around all of these different communities. And he's writing Luke. He will eventually write Acts. And what he wants to do is, is connect what's happening in Acts to what's going on in Luke. He's wanting to make sure that the ministry of Jesus connects to what's happening in the churches that he's visiting along with Paul. Now, that's going to be my summation. That's my understanding of it. And he's wanting them to understand. So this Holy Spirit that's being poured out is the good gifts that God gives. God's a giver and he gives you the Holy Spirit. And the moving of the Holy Spirit in your community is a good thing. It's not a stone. It's not an, a snake. And it's not anything harmful. It's the good gifts that God wants to give you. And this is something that Luke's, I believe, wanting to communicate the Holy Spirit coming into a community is the good gifts that God gives. So, let's have a look at the Holy Spirit coming to a community. Acts chapter 2. You were right, Pastor Hugh, in devotions. We couldn't have gone through today without getting the Acts 2. So, Acts 2. And again, we're joining up the dots. This is the good gifts that Jesus said the Father gives. Acts 2, verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. You see, this gift that's poured out. The Holy Spirit is the good gifts that God gives. Holy Spirit is a good gift. We need to remember that, remind ourselves of that. Sometimes we put ourselves in the category of, oh, well, that's for them. They're a wee bit more eccentric and extrovert. That's for, no, no, the Holy Spirit is the good gift for you and for me. 
And God gives good gifts. Somebody say amen today. He gives good gifts. And so whenever this good gift comes, what are some of the things that happen? And obviously there's a lot of symbolism within Acts chapter 2. And some of the symbolism, we think of the fire. And uh, we were speaking with the young people a number of months ago, and we, we did a bit of a comeback on it, but I'll not do that on you today. I'll just give you a few things, right? But a couple of things that I think about whenever I think of fire, I think of purity. So traditionally in the, in, in the scriptures, fire means judgment. It means cleansing. It means purity. And so there's the moving of the fire. The Holy Spirit comes to burn up the rubbish and the excess stuff in our lives. He comes to make us holy and to make us pure. And, and there's passion that's released. I think of fire and the intensity of fire and the raging of a fire and, and, and passion then is released within our lives through the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we see the difference of people who are waiting in Jerusalem and then Acts just breaks out. These people with passion, these people that were locked in in fear because of what had happened to Jesus and not knowing where to go, but the Holy Spirit comes into their midst and passion is released and they, they don't care what comes their way. It's we're going to live for Jesus. We're going to go for God because this good gift of the Holy Spirit has put a fire within my bones and I'm passionate for the things of God. That was their heart and that's what happens for us when the Spirit of God fills our lives. I think of power as well. Power, I mean, I, uh, is it okay to talk about bonfires? We don't really do them, um, but we did take exactly his first bonfire last year just to stand and watch and see this bonfire and the power that raged from this bonfire and everybody having to step away back for this mighty bonfire, the, the fire, and we see what fire does, rips through communities when it need, whenever it's uncontrolled. It, it does so many things. There's power, and that's what the Holy Spirit came to do. For the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to recovery of sight to the blind. There's power when, it come, when the Spirit comes upon our lives, not just religiosity, not just going through the day-to-day, -day, but power to walk in freedom, power to walk in victory, power to, to, to overcome and see breakthrough into our lives, power to step up beyond the normal mediocre day to day. There's power when the Holy Spirit comes into a community. And whenever the Holy Spirit's in our midst, then people who walk in through that door can't walk back out through that door because there's power to make a difference in our lives. There's power when the Spirit comes into our midst. And so this fire that rages and rested, do you notice, um, I'm way ahead of myself, but on everyone, and we'll get there okay, but the fire comes, and that's the point for each person. I think of the wind, the breath of life, and so some of us were maybe here, and we're, we're just feeling a bit short of breath, and maybe not physically, but emotionally, maybe spiritually, maybe just in life, we're a bit punctured, we're a bit out of breath, we're a bit like, oh, I could really do with my second wind, and this isn't just a second wind of to, just to perk us up a little bit. This is God breathing his life into our very being, that we would come alive, that we would come alive in him, that we're not dead or asleep, but that he would breathe in us. I think of wind and I think of refreshment. And whenever we've sat in, in the beautiful heat of a day, and it's like, oh, this is so, so warm. And we've been on those 40 degrees holiday, and it's like, oh my God, but a breeze comes and it's refreshing. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He refreshes us. I don't know about you. I would pray today, God, come with fire. Come with the wind of God. Come and move. And then there's the release of worship and the release of witness through tongues, through, through the spiritual gifts. He wants to come and take us beyond our own ability, our own ability to worship, our own ability to witness, our own ability to live out this life and reach the world that's out there for him. And he comes and empowers us to do that. That's God's heart today. That's what he wants to do. This is what the Holy Spirit brings to our lives. And the Holy Spirit is a good gift from the Father. Amen? He's a good gift from the Father. So, God gives good gifts to everyone. Okay? To everyone. Verse 9. I nearly got everybody to say back to me, to everyone. But I've seen a reel and apparently people hate that. So, um, so but to everyone. Okay? To everyone. I thought somebody might repeat it anyway, just for the banter. Everyone. <laughs> well, we'll start mayhem. Okay, verse 9 of what the passage that we read, it says this. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. 
The one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So the key is everyone. The world that Jesus ministered into was very divided. You had the in crowd, and you had demons. Okay, so that's the Belfast version of it, okay? So you had the in crowd, and you had them. Right? So there was the in crowd, the very religious, the people that set all the rules, the people that somehow were able to, on the surface anyway, live life and seem to have it all together and seem to have all the I's dotted and all the T's crossed. And they were in the in crowd and they looked down on their nose at them and those people that were the outsiders in the community, those people that just struggled a bit more, those people who maybe didn't get the start that they had, those people who maybe just made some mistakes or fell along the way or, or selfishness got a better of them and they, they lived a particular way. And Jesus Jesus tried to balance a lot of his ministry between the two crowds. He tried, and, and often the in crowd wanted to pull Jesus into them and, and be one of us and don't behave like them and don't meet with them and don't talk to them. But Jesus loved these guys and he tried to teach them and talk to them, people like Nicodemus and others. He tried to connect in with them, but he also connected in with this crowd. And he wanted to teach those people who were the outsiders, the outcasts, the people that weren't part of the in crowd, that they were in God's in crowd. That's what he was trying to show them and teach them and say to them. And Luke has a particular passion for them. Right? So whenever Luke is writing in Luke and in Acts, read it again and you'll see Luke's passion for them. Okay? Now you'll not find that in a scholarly book because they wouldn't say them. Right? But, but Luke's passion is for the outcast. Luke's passion is for the people that feel like they're on the outskirts. And let me show you how I think that. So right before this, in Luke chapter 10, there's a story. There's a story of the Good Samaritan. And remember, Jesus has preached for three years constantly. And John says we could fill libraries with everything that Jesus has said. So whenever Luke is writing, he, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is trying to get some stuff across. He's trying to help the person that reads it to understand something. Okay, he's not just writing history as it is. He's also preaching a sermon and trying to get a message across. And so in Luke chapter 10, he tells us about the Good Samaritan. What happened to the Good Samaritan? The, group, the Good Samaritan wasn't even in this group of them. He was in that group of them, the Samaritan. Right? But then there's this fellow that walks along. He gets robbed. We know the story. But the in crowd walk over him and ignore him because he's one of them. But then the Good Samaritan comes along lifts him up, tends to him, does all of that. And the idea is that Jesus wants to come along to the outsider, to the, to the one that life's beaten up on, and he wants to help that person. And that's what we're meant to be like. As he carries on, Luke is where we find the parables of the, the lost coin. And heaven rejoices when a sinner repents. It's the, it's the, the, the book of the lost sheep. Would Jesus not leave the 99 and go and find, or the shepherd, and find the one that was lost? What's he constantly trying to say? God's after them. He's not just into the in crowd. He's into everyone. It's everyone. It's also where we find the parable of the prodigal son. This young fellow, through his own decisions, finds himself on the outside. And there's a beautiful word. I love this word. So, yeah, if I was brave enough, I would have it tattooed over my body somewhere, but I won't do it. It's okay, right? Epipepto. Epipepto is a beautiful word. And it's the word translated in some of our old, old texts where um, it, it's translated and it says that the father saw him coming from a long way off and he ran to him and fell on his neck. Do you know that? that or he embraced him. And it's that embrace, it's that it's that. This is my son. It's an embrace of, uh, of protection, of acceptance. It's an embrace of you're in, you're no longer out. And he uses that word. Now, hold that in your thoughts. And if you, in your mind, go to Acts chapter 10. In fact, go to Acts chapter 10 and verse 44. And I'm just nerding out on you a wee bit, but that's okay. Just love this. So, Acts 10, 44. Yeah. So, so what happens is, even when the early church, so the early church was formed out of a group that was in the them group. Okay, it was Peter, John, the apostles, the disciples. Those guys, they weren't in the in group. But they all get rescued by Jesus. They get filled by the Holy Spirit. They become the church and they become the in group. Isn't that really weird how we can do that? 
how we can go from being lemons to then creating an in-group but then something else. We're always looking to belong, so we create these wee in-groups. Not that churches would ever do that, right? So let's be careful of that, okay? Creating an in-group and a lemons. So the church become in their own minds the in-group. They're enjoying the Holy Spirit, and their understanding is that the Spirit came to Jewish believers. Why would he come to anybody else? Why would he go to Gentiles? What would that all be about? And so, through a series of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a series of um, <coughs> visions that Peter has in Acts chapter 10, you read the whole story, Peter's like, okay, there's a bigger world here. God's trying to say or do something else here. And then he gets this invite to go to Cornelius' house. He goes to Cornelius' house. Cornelius is a Gentile. It's full of Gentiles. It's full of people who weren't part of the Jewish nation. And Peter had no reference or no understanding that they could ever be in the in-group. They were themans. But Peter decides, because the Lord has told him to be there, and he starts to preach, he starts to declare, and listen to this in verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all those who heard the message. That word came on. Have a little guess what the word is. Come on, give it, give it. Ep, ep, epipepto, right? Now remember, same writer, okay? Luke's writing one, he's writing the other. What's he trying to get through this here? That the Father, through the Holy Spirit, has embraced these people. The people here on the outside. See, I get goosebumps with that. I don't, maybe you're like, well, I'll have to let that settle. But I get goosebumps with that because it's like, here's these people who were them. And, 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 but the Holy Spirit, in the same way that, that the Father comes to the Son, the Holy Spirit comes and he embraces them. Now listen to what uh, Peter's reaction is. So the circumcised, so the Jewish believers, the in crowd who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out. Even on the Gentiles, like, whoa, 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 we've no reference for this. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising in God. Then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized? In other words, can we stop them from being the in crowd now? No, 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 we can't. They're in. They're part of it. And that's really exciting for you and me. Because there might be lots of reasons why. And it mightn't be because of our birth. And it mightn't be because we're not part of a religious sect or whatever, uh, we might have different reasons why we would rule ourselves out from the good gifts of God and especially from the Holy Spirit moving in our lives. And we might think it's because of our personality type. We might think it's because of some of the things that we've done in life. We might think it's because of, of, of our story or our history or our baggage or our brokenness or the things that we have in our lives. But what God wants to do through the power of the Holy Spirit is to come and give us good gifts and to epipipto us and to come on us, pour out His Holy Spirit upon us and do for us what he's done for people right through the ages. Amen, pastor. That sounds lovely. The Holy Spirit is for everyone. He's for you and for me, and that's what he wants to do. Everyone. So God gives good gifts to everyone who asks. So here's the thing, guys. The Holy Spirit doesn't just come and impact our lives through osmosis. Like if I stand somewhere long enough, it'll happen. The Holy Spirit comes to those who ask. The moving of the Holy Spirit in our lives comes when we ask. See, James 4, 2 says, you do not have because you do not ask God. We need to ask. And so Jesus' poem comes and it's relevant here. So I say, do you ask? Seek? Knock? Some of you people who have been about church long enough will know that in the Greek, this is a present continuous. This is ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. It's a persistence which carries through from the other story. It's persistence. So we need to be persistent. Not because we need to twist God's arm up his back, but because there's something about asking and there's something about persistence that, first of all, positions us to receive and postures us to receive. We need to be in the right place, positioning our hearts, positioning our lives, and posturing ourselves. Persistence is required. God desires to give us. God is not holding back. But we need to position and posture ourselves through asking, seeking, knocking. 
Um, Pastor Hugh and I had a privilege of sitting this week with a, a guy, do we call him a rabbi? Is he like a rabbi? He's a Christian rabbi. But a guy he understands a lot of the Hebrew and, and it's sort of, you spend a number of hours just working through a text. And there was, um, in 1 Kings 3, and we found this just fascinating, the, the language, so we are, we're often used to hearing um, God comes to, to Solomon and says, ask for whatever you want. And so we were told this week that that's not actually in the original. The original would be termed like this. Ask what I'm giving to you. Ask what I'm giving to you. And I thought this was really relevant for this because it was like God already wanted to give Solomon wisdom. So ask for it, position yourself. Posture yourself for what I want to do for your life. And it's the same with the Holy Spirit. Ask what I'm giving to you. He wants to give us the Holy Spirit. I know we all as Christians have the Holy Spirit. We couldn't be regenerated and live. But I don't know about you, but I need filled with the Holy Spirit. And I need that power, that passion, that, and I need it afresh. And so we come, and we, guys in the worship team, could you come? I got so carried away there, I didn't realize it at the end. And people went, amen. <laughs> but we posture ourselves. Could we all, if you're able to stand, could we stand? God gives good gifts to everyone who asks. And specifically, the good gift here, the good gift that Luke talks about is the Holy Spirit. And we all need the Holy Spirit for everyone. Now, your experience and my experience might be completely different of how the Holy Spirit interacts, and that's totally okay, because it's not this formulaic thing. But I could, I could guarantee you every single one of us today need the fresh breath of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Surely every single one of us in the room could do with God turning up the thermostat a fire within our lives. We say, God, come and fill us. Come and move in our lives. For some of us, our experience of the Holy Spirit is demonstrative and that's okay. And for some of us, it's very silent and quiet and deep and and that's okay too because we don't set this big formula thing up we just say God come God come and I was chatting to a friend of mine and now we do believe in praying for individuals and hopefully we'll do a bit of that tonight if, if people are up for that and want that but I was chatting to a friend and he said you know one of the things I've noticed is in the Bible most of the times the Holy Spirit comes he comes on a whole community at once Fills them. Fills them. So I wonder if we could open our hearts as a community. We could ask, seek, and knock. And say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. We are hungry for you. We position ourselves to receive from you. Come Lord. So, Father, I'd be bold enough to pray for that wind to come. The wind of God, the breath of God, to revive those who are weary, those who are puffed and out of breath. Come, Lord. Come, O oh God. Come, O oh God. Just let that wind be released. Lord and we by faith are receiving we're not waiting for something to feel like it we're just saying God you've said you'll pour it out so we receive from you so if you're here this morning and you're puffed out in life you're weary you're out of breath spiritually, emotionally just breathe in a breath of God come O oh Lord Come, O oh Lord. Father God. Pour out your spirit, Lord. Pour out your spirit. 
For some of you, you know that the fire has gone to embers. We know that wind is a really good, that, that breath, that air that comes in. So Lord, breathe on the embers today. Breathe on the embers today. Light a fire. Ignite something in our hearts, Father, that's more than us whipping ourselves up because that only lasts for a day or two. But you come and you change us. You come and you fill us. So come, O oh God. And come, Father, even like on Acts 2, where you released worship, you released tongues, you released spirit-inspired worship and prophecy, Father, would you come and move? Would you come, Father, that this is not just flesh and bone, but that you have breathed into this community, that you have breathed and set us alight for you more and more and more and more and more. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. We receive from you. We receive from you, O God. Come, Holy Spirit.